Uh, thank you, Am, for that, uh, that uh, introduction. And uh, also, I would like to really uh, stress uh, the importance and, and our gratitude from the First Nations Studies Program um, for the oh, <coughs> sorry, help that Am has provided us in, in setting up this, uh, this event tonight. I'd also like to start by acknowledging that we are, of course, situated here on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil uh, First Nations. Uh, I have had the honor to work on these territories uh, for the last, uh, well, until, or since 2008, and, and it is an honor and a privilege to have done so. Um, speaking of honor and privileges, I have uh, the honor and privilege again uh, to introduce our, our esteemed guest speaker for you here tonight. Uh, Leanne Simpson is Anishinaabe from the Alderville First Nation. Uh, she is a, a prolific scholar, storyteller, and activist who holds a PhD from the University of Manitoba. Um, and she teaches in the doctoral program in Indigenous Studies at Trenton University. She has also lectured at the University of British Columbia, Athabasca University, Ryerson University, uh, the University of Victoria and Manitoba, uh, the University of Winnipeg, and then of course with me at the Dechinta Center for uh, Research and Learning on Yellowknife's Dene Territory um, in Denende. I have had the honor to work with Leanne on a number of projects since 2001. Uh, when she was starting when she was a professor of mine in the Indigenous Governance Program at the University of Victoria. Since then, Leanne has been a friend and a mentor to me and to who I owe an incredible intellectual debt. Uh, her work on Indigenous resurgence is a benchmark in the field of Indigenous studies and serves as a paradigmatic expression of what a truly decolonized Indigenous feminist ethics and politics looks like in our present. Leanne's work and the political commitments that it represents uh, serves as an inspiration to myself and to many of our students in the First Nations Studies program. So I want to thank her for that. Merci, Cho. Leanne has published two edited volumes, including Lighting the Eighth Fire, The Liberation, Resurgence, and Protection of Indigenous Nations, uh, published by Arbiter Ring Press in 2008. And with Kiara Ladner, this is an honor song, 20 years since the barricades, in celebration of the 20 year anniversary of the so-called Oka crisis, published in 2010, also by Arbiter Ring Press. Dr. Simpson has published over 30 scholarly articles and written for publications such as Now Magazine, Spirit Magazine, Anishinaabek News, The Link, Briar Patch Magazine, uh, The Dominion, Muskrat Magazine, Racialisis, Rabble, Huffington Post, and Canadian Art Magazine, among many others. Her third book, Dancing on Our Turtles' Back, Stories of uh, Nishnabeg uh, Recreation, Resurgence, and a New Emergence, was published in two, or 2011 by Arbiter Ring, and turns to uh, Anishinaabe theory and philosophy for guidance in building and maintaining resurgence indigenous movements for decolonization. This is a work of profound philosophical depth and importance, which has become a staple text in First Nation Studies program at UBC, but also in the field of Indigenous studies elsewhere. Leanne is a traditional storyteller and has performed at Indigenous arts festivals throughout Ontario. Um, um, her, first, uh, her first book of short stories, Islands of Decolonial Love, explores love and the connection within contemporary Anishinaabe life in a series of sharp, witty, and insightful stories and has uh, full-length accompanying storytelling and music featured from Indigenous musicians from across Canada and Turtle Island. Also published in 2013, um, is Leanne's collection of retold traditional um, Anishinaabe stories, The Gift in the Making, from uh, Debway, the Debway series at High Tower Press, High Water Press, sorry, based on her oral practice and traditions of storytelling. This book captures the imagination of young and old alike as they are immersed in the story um, life of her people. And finally, Leanne is currently working on an indigenous edit with an indigenous editorial collective gathering together writings and art from the I Don't Know More movement. Watch for this book called The Winter We Dance, Voices from the Past, Future, and the I Don't Know More movement coming from Ar Arbiter Ring Press, um, I believe, this spring. A number of Leanne's books also are available at the front. Uh, we have a couple of volunteers that are there. Um, 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 selling them if, uh, if you're so interested at the end. So please join me in uh, warmly welcoming my friend and our teacher, Leanne Simpson. Masucho. I 
I need a few minutes to recover from that introduction. <laughs> um, bonjour, Ani, Kenewaya, Gidigabajuni Denewema, Nin Machi Sagi Kinishnabe Kwe, Vitas Musak Nindingo, Kinagachi and Nishnabek Ogaming Nadonjaba. Nigachi Nendam Gibijayan Nonga Ma and the Ek, Kinawa Musquim Aki. Guamish aki, minua, slewa tooth aki, chi mi gwech. Nikichinendem gibijayan gibibwachanguk. Thanks so much to the organizers for this, uh, this uh, fantastic opportunity for me to come and share my perspectives on nationhood and reconciliation and resurgence. Um, I'm a Mississauga in Nishnabek. Our territory is on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And I'm so very, very happy to be honored and honored to be with you tonight and to share some of my perspectives on both land and reconciliation. Over this past month, we've all watched the events unfold in Migamage that resulted in the RCMP violently attacking land protectors in El Sipuktuk, and we're all sort of waiting for the second wave of that. This triggered a host of really amazing solidarity actions from indigenous people and our supporters all over North America. Of course, because it resonated with us as indigenous people. We've all been violently dispossessed of most of our land to make room for settlement and natural resource development. We know the drill. Our lands are threatened by deforestation, mining, hydroelectric development, fracking, whatever. And so we start out dissenting and registering our dissent through state-sanctioned mechanisms like environmental impact assessments. Our dissent is ignored. Some of us explore Canadian legal strategies even though the courts are stacked against us. And slowly but surely, we get backed into the corner where the only thing left to do is to put our bodies on the land. The response is always the same. Intimidation, force, violence, media smear campaigns, criminalization, silence, talk, negotiation, promises of new relationships, placated resistance, and then more broken promises. Then the cycle repeats itself. Intimidation, force, violence, media smear campaigns, criminalization, silence, talk, negotiation, new relationships, promises, placated resistance, and then more broken promises. Repeat. I've lived through or been involved with or done solidarity work through a number of these flashpoints of resistance now. My first protest was with the James Bay Cree and their fight against the Great Whale Project. My entire indigenous political education came from Ellen Gabriel and the resistance at Ganawaga and Ganasataki, known as the Oka Crisis. I grew up an hour away from Ipawash and was at the blockade the day before the shooting. When I look back on this 20 years, what is really crystal clear to me is that these gifts of reconciliation, whether they're treaties, royal commissions, or inquiries, are an integral part of a much larger cycle of settler colonial violence and occupation, even though they are positioned by the state as a break in the cycle, as a way out of the cycle, as turning over a new leaf and embarking on a new relationship based on mutual respect and trust or whatever the language of the day. In reality, I think they actually enable and propel the cycle of settler violence, primarily because they do nothing to address the root of the problem. And the root of the problem, in my mind, is the dispossession of indigenous peoples from our homeland. The root of the problem is land and how we're gonna share it. In the East, we started reconciling with settler governments in the 1700s, when it became clear to us that the majority of settlers and their beginning governing structures were refusing to conform to indigenous values and political ideologies, and that this refusal was causing a great deal of damage to the land and to our peoples. 
At this point in time, we had lots of experience within our own political traditions in reconciling difference and in generating consensus. This basic concept of reconciling over land between two or more nations, of figuring out a way of sharing land in a way that ensures both nations would thrive and would be able to maintain their political systems and cultures and language and life ways, that both would be able to respect those separate jurisdictions in nationhood, that both would together ensure the health and well-being of each other, and that both would work together to ensure the land was healthy for the coming generations. This, to me, was the impetus for those early, early treaties. Because within the political systems of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, or Mi'kma'ki, or Anishinaabek, Treaty making was a political way of solving international problems and generating consensus across nations. This was not a tricky concept for us. The Mississauga and Anishinaabek had shared parts of our territory successfully with the, with the Wendat or the Huron for years and years. We share our homeland with our clans, the animal nations. We share our homelands with the plant nations. We have complex ceremonies and protocols that enable and nurture those relationships. We continue to share parts of our territory with the Haudenosaunee through our treaties and our wampum. The Santi Mayomi, that's the traditional governing structure of the Mi'kmaq, began this work in their confederacy in the 1700s. And it began in a similar time in the Mississauga part of the Anishinaabek Nation with the Gunshot Treaty and the Treaty of Niagara and a host of other agreements. These political, ceremonial, spiritual process of building intimate friendships across nations worked very well until we tried to do the same with settlers and not for lack of trying. For close to 300 years, my people have been participating in British and then Canadian reconciliation process, meeting to resolve conflict, negotiating, dialoguing, agreeing to turn over the new leaf, agreeing to build a new relationship based on respect and sharing and accepting the promises of the state. We have no land to show for that. We have no land to show for that. We have retained no land rights in those 300 years of negotiating, despite having intelligent, articulate, persistent, committed Anishinaabek negotiators who are only ever concerned with ensuring that my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren had a land base to continue their culture and their life way. And through this lens, I have to ask myself, is Canadian reconciliation designed to gut our social movements? Is it just the abusers showing up with a bouquet of flowers and then back to the same thing the very next day? Because if reconciliation is just about talking and apologizing without any action, without any action to dismantle the system of settler colonialism, then how can the relationship change? If we aren't talking honestly about how indigenous peoples have been dispossessed of our homelands, how are we going to remedy the situation? How are we doing anything but maintaining the status quo? While the nation-to-nation -nation nature of treaties is certainly part of our political traditions, present in the oral traditions, and even gestured to in the minutes taken during those negotiations, as soon as those documents were signed, the settler state used them exclusively to erase indigenous nationhood, sovereignty, and rights from our homeland every time. There have been endless opportunities for reconciliation year after year after year. What's different this time? For reconciliation to be a transformative process for me, I need action over words. And I need the action to be grounded in the root cause of the problem, that dispossession. And I do need to say a little bit about the truth and reconciliation process in Canada because I've witnessed a few Canadians that have been transformed and politicized through their participation in this process, and this is a very, very good thing. I've also seen a few survivors find peace and healing through participation in that process, and that's also a very good thing. And I do think that the TRC has been able to insert an important conversation about residential schools and their history of abuse into mainstream Canada. And so my comments today are not necessarily critiquing that process, but this wider project of reconciling 
our relationship, of my relationship to the Canadian state. I work a lot with youth through land-based education courses at universities, but more often in programs and informal situations outside of those institutions. And in all of these programs, I count, encounter youth that are exceedingly interested in gaining on the land skills, canoeing, hunting, fishing, making birch bark baskets and drums, learning to survive in the winter, snaring rabbits. They have an amazing, beautiful, strong desire for self-sufficiency. And they already know, and some of them are only five years old, they already know that being out on the land feels good. They already derive joy and meaning from having a healthy relationship to the land. And the components to these education programs are easy. Often I don't have funding and I never have curriculum because there isn't any and because I think that curriculum kills learning for kids. I have the land, I have the kids, and I have a few elders that love and respect those little beings. Last October, I took a group of 30 Anishinaabe people of families to one of our sacred sites for a Feast of the Dead ceremony. This is a ceremony where we, we sort of feed our ancestors and we connect to the ones that have come before us. The Serpent Mounds is an ancient burial site on the north shore of Rice Lake and Hiawatha First Nations acts as the caretaker of this sacred place. The land was returned to them, to the reserve, after being leased to the province to make the site into a provincial park. And it's very rare that land gets returned to indigenous people. And so <laughs> there is a reason for suspicion. <laughs> because when the, province plant, uh, when the province set up the campground, they planted fast growing trees from the southern US, Carolinian poplars in the park, so that the campers could have shade. And of course, all of these trees are now falling down because they're not adapted for our climate. And the campground is unusable until Hiawatha can figure out a way to remove the trees and start again. To gain access to the site then requires the permission of the chief and council because of those safety concerns. Now this place holds a tremendous amount of meaning for Mississauga and Anishinaabek people, even in my family, and we were removed from our territory through tuberculosis and sanitariums um, two generations before me. But my grandmother made an effort to take us back to the Serpent Mounds to camp every few years. And so this was the only place in my territory that as a child I interacted with. It holds a lot of significance to me and to us. And so last October, I asked my fellow Mississauga Anishinaabek for permission to hold that ceremony on our lands, which involved the per getting the permission of the band council and signing waivers in case one of those Carolinian poplars fell on us. They were very happy to have us. On the morning of the ceremony, we drove our cars to the site. I pulled off the highway into a small gravel parking lot outside of the gates, and I was immediately met by an angry white man who bounded towards my carload of kids, banged on the window, and aggressively demanded that I move my car. I agreed. I was nice. I was charming, even. <laughs> and I parked on the side of the road. The man then proceeded to call the Ontario Provincial Police and report our group of young families for trespassing. An hour later, in the middle of the ceremony, a young white OPP officer burst into the middle of the ceremony with her hand on her gun. She greeted me with a loud, so I guess you can't read, referring to the sign posted on the front gate, indicating the site was closed. I won't ever forget the look on those little kids' faces. Lucky for us, an officer from Hiawatha First Nation was following her, whom we knew, and our elder spoke directly to him, and the OPP immediately backed off. But unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident. In the past year alone, I've had cottagers, farmers, police, game wardens, and municipal workers approach my family while we are harvesting rice, or picking cedar, or picking medicines, fishing, finding rocks for our sweats. Last month, the OPP questioned us as we took our PhD class ricing. And these interactions have yet to be friendly. Most of the time, they are aggressive and racist. 
And in all of these incidences, the underlying message is that I shouldn't be there, that I shouldn't be in my homeland living as an Anishinaabe Kwe. On our way home from the Serpent Mounds that day, my then seven-year-old daughter asked me why the police would want to try to make us feel badly about doing our ceremony. I relished in the fact that she said, try. We talked about what might have motivated the police to make us feel ashamed. And then we talked about all the wonderful other things that had happened that day. The friends that we were with, the songs that we sang, the food that we shared, the responsibilities to our land. I thought of all of the elders that I know who have had their lodges burned down. I thought of all of the people that have been criminalized and harassed and pushed off our lands to make room for lift locks and cottages and more. And I thought of all of the people that stood firm, grounded in our traditions and in our responsibilities to be here in our territory on our land. This past summer, my family and I had the opportunity to spend some time on the land with uh, some amazing Denny folks at the Decenta Center for Learning and Research, which is a really amazing on the land university type education. On about the third day, I was helping the same daughter get ready for bed, and we were reminiscing about the things that we had been doing on the land. And she asked me why the police weren't watching us. And I was tired, and I actually didn't understand what she was talking about, but she was very persistent. And what she was asking me is why is no one, why are the white authorities not watching us, not watching what we're doing? and my heart broke a little bit. Because my partner and I have sacrificed a little bit to set up our lives so that I can be on the land a lot and do this resurgent work. And it dawned on me that maybe the message that I had so desperately been trying to convey to my kids in terms of having a strong connection to the land and knowing our ceremonies and songs and stories was being trumped by this kind of settler surveillance. And it's being done by the authorities for sure, but it's also being done by regular Canadians. And of course, you know, my daughter's eight now and, and the Dene are under incredible pressure from extractivist interests, mining interests, oil and glass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course they live under the same system of settler colonial, colonial surveillance even though it manifests itself in a slightly different way. But I think what my daughter's point was is that Mississauga people are made to feel very badly about being on the land, and I'm watching my kids inherit that. There are very, very few ways that I can protect them from that. All I can really do as a mother is to help them process it and develop community around it. But part of what my kids are also inheriting is a very deliberate and long-standing Mississauga tradition of resistance as well. Our old storytellers, particularly at Curve Lake, have tended to transform the heartbreak of these kinds of incidents into hilarious, victorious, embellished stories of our elders getting away from game wardens in canoes, on kayaks, on foot, and even by jumping over 20 feet of open water with skates on. <laughs> so my point in telling you all of this is that for me, Personally, there is a very, very huge, very real disconnect between the discourse of Canadian reconciliation, and this becomes most pronounced when I think about my experiences on the land. When I'm out in my homeland living in some of the ways my ancestors intended, I'm continually attacked and harassed. And my family, the people that I care the most about in the world, bear the brunt of that trauma. Land has never really been a part of the Canadian reconciliation discourse. And this is a critical problem because indigenous peoples will not survive as indigenous peoples without homelands. And at this point in my spiel, usually some young, articulate, intelligent, young indigenous person stands up and says, that's great, Leanne. But you know what? I live in a city and my nation is occupied by downtown Toronto or downtown Vancouver and so I have to figure out how to regenerate and how to restore nationhood without land. And I have to figure out a way to survive as an indigenous person without land. 
And that statement always fills me with great hope because I think we have amazing, articulate, intelligent youth that are going to carry on this fight and they're going to find solutions that I can't even envision right now. I live in downtown Peterborough, which is a city of 70,000 people, and it's about an hour and a half outside of Toronto, but it's about two and a half hours if you have to drive it <laughs> on the highway. Um, and I feel really privileged that I can be on the land in about 20 minutes, um, which is why I live where I live. And so I want to challenge this idea that we can't do anything to address dispossession in urban environments, because I think that's an insanely incorrect assumption. This morning, I went for a run in a stolen 400 hectare rainforest in downtown Vancouver, and it was just begging to be returned to its rightful owners. I watched the Saanich install a sign on top of Mount Douglas that restores its original name to Pakals in Victoria. I watched on the internet, I should have said. <laughs> there are pockets of wilderness in every single Canadian city that were stolen from local indigenous people. The Forks in Winnipeg, Toronto Island, High Park, Rouge Park. And you know what? When an individual, even within Canadian law, steals a really expensive car and gets caught, they still have to give it back. They don't get to keep it because it's worth a lot of money and they really like it. <laughs> And so for us, this stolen piece of wilderness for Mississauga people is the Kawartha Highlands Signature Park, which is this piece of 375 square kilometers of wilderness about 50 kilometers north of Peterborough, where as signatories of the Williams Treaty, we now have treaty rights in an interim agreement. And the elder that I work with believes very strongly that this area should be given back to us. His grandfather's trap line and hunting grounds are in this area, and it's been in his family for generations. He also believes very strongly that the province has designated this a provincial park to alienate Anishinaabek people from our settler allies, who very much enjoy camping and canoeing and kayaking in the park. And so my elder thinks that by designating the very few wilderness areas that we have left in the province as a protective area, that Ontario doesn't have to worry about resistance because this tiny group of settlers that supports us will not support us gaining land that is designated as a protected area. They believe that because it's part of the commons, that Anishinaabek have the same rights as Canadians to use the park. And I think there's a lot of truth in this elder's thinking, because what he's saying is that this idea of commons erases Anishinaabek nationhood, erases our self-determination, our sovereignty, and our land rights. It maintains our dispossession in a way that is acceptable to many of our settler allies, because we can all use the land. Mississauga Anishinaabek people know this colonial trickery better than anyone because it's this idea of commons that was used by uh, the Ontario government and the Canadian state to bully our leaders into signing the Williams Treaty in the first place. They said, don't worry about your hunting and fishing rights. You'll have the same rights as everyone else in the province, and that includes the ability to hunt and fish, which was true and which also was a lie because the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources also regulates hunting and fishing in a way that is a direct attack on Anishinaabek food sovereignty. How do you feed your family when you're, pro you're prohibited from hunting deer and when you can't fish from October 15th to July 1st every year? How do you feed your family when 90% of the wild rice harvest has been destroyed? Why did my ancestors sign treaties after we lost the political power to have agency? They signed them because they were starving and they wanted me, at the very least, to be alive. And so what's the alternative to the commons? What's the alternative to dispossession? I think it's regenerating, it's strengthening, it's reestablishing the unique and diverse indigenous nationhoods. It's rebuilding the original attentions of my ancestors, which was for me and the ancestors that haven't been born yet, to live as Mississauga and Anishinaabek, unfettered and unharassed in our homeland. I want my great-grandchildren to be able to fall in love with every piece of our territory. 
I want their bodies to carry with them every story, every song, every piece of poetry hidden in our Anishinaabek language. I want them to be able to dance through their lives with joy. I want them to live without fear because they know respect, because they know in their bones what respect feels like. I want them to live without fear because they have a pristine environment with clean waterways that will provide them with the physical and emotional sustenance to uphold their responsibilities to the land, their family, their community, and their nation. I want them to be valued, to be heard, to be cherished by our communities and by Canada, no matter what their skin color, their physical and mental abilities, their sexual or their gender orientation. I want my great-great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren to be able to live as Mississauga and Anishinaabek in our homeland. The idea of my arms embracing my grandchildren and their arms embracing their grandchildren is communicated in the Anishinaabe word kobade. And according to my elder Edna Manatawave, kobade is a, use that we ref a word that we use to refer to both our great-great-grandparents and our great-grandchildren. It means a link in a chain, a link between the generations, between nations, between states of being, between individuals. I'm a link in a chain. We are all links in a chain. And Doug Williams, a Mississauga Anishinaabek elder from Curve Lake, calls our nation Kinagachi Anishinaabek Ogumik, the place where we all live and work together. Our nation is a hub of Anishinaabe networks. It's a long COVID day cycling through time. It's a web of connections to each other, to the plant nations, to the animal nations, the rivers, the lakes, the cosmos, and our neighboring indigenous nations. Kinegachi Anishinaabek Ogumik is an ecology of intimacy. It is an ecology of relationships in the absence of coercion, authoritarian power, and hierarchy. Kinegachi Anishinaabek Ogumik is connectivity based on the sanctity of the land, the love that we have for our families, our language, and our way of life. It's relationships based on deep, deep reciprocity, respect, non-interference, self-determination, and freedom. Our nationhood is based on the idea that our earth is our first mother, that natural resources are not natural resources at all, but gifts from that mother. Our nationhood is based on the foundational concept that we should give up what we can to support the integrity of our homelands for the coming generations. We should give more than we take. It's nationhood based on a series of radiating responsibilities. And this is what I understand our diplomats were negotiating when settlers first arrived in our, in our territory. This was the impetus for those first treaties. Anishinaabe freedom, protection for the land and the environment, a space, an intellectual, political, spiritual, artistic, creative, and physical space where we could live as Anishinaabe and where our COVID day could do the same. This is what my ancestors wanted for me, for us. They wanted for our generation to practice Anishinaabe governance over our homeland, to partner with other governments over shared land, and to have the ability to make decisions about how the gifts of our mother would be used for the benefit of our people and in a manner that promotes her sanctity for the coming generations. I believe my ancestors expected the settler state to recognize my nation, our lands, and the political and cultural norms of the territory. I am not a nation state, nor do I strive to be one. Our politics and our nationalism are not based on enclosures defended with violence, yet we still have homelands. We've had them for thousands and thousands of years. My nationhood doesn't just radiate outwards, it also radiates inwards. It's my physical body, my mind, my spirit. It's our families, and not the nuclear family that's been normalized in settler society, but big, beautiful, diverse, extended, multiracial families of relatives and friends that care very, very deeply for each other. Nation building must be at the core of reconciliation in order for it to be meaningful to me. 
So what does resurgence in nation building look like in urban centers? What does reclaim, rename, reoccupy look like in the city? We have to take our space in the city. We have to come into it with a sense of power. We have to insert and assert ourselves in urban areas because cities are on indigenous land as well. Cities are part of our homelands. The forces of dispossession and erasure operate here too. And it's challenging. It's challenging because the development and environmental degradation in urban areas is severe. But you know what? You do not abandon your mother when she is sick. You do not abandon the land because it's contaminated or encroached upon. You sit with your mother. You talk to her. You nurture her. You heal her because in doing so, you heal yourself. We heal ourselves. Now, I can't safely hunt deer in downtown Peterborough. <laughs> or I haven't figured out a way. <laughs> But you know what, there's this forest, there's a choir of maple trees all over different people's lawns and in the boulevards that are just begging to be tapped for maple syrup. There are sacred places within the city. There are burial grounds and grocery store parking lots in Peterborough. There's the river, the drumlins, the old portages, the old campsites. There are so many opportunities for language revitalization in the city, place names, stories. There's a tremendous amount of resurgence work in cities that is being done by the indigenous artistic community. And this is one community that has always been willing to live below their means in order to be producers and not consumers. They're willing to live their lives aligned with those creation stories as makers, often at the expense of making money. And so 30 years ago, a group of indigenous theater artists got together for the purposes of creating an indigenous theater movement as a site of language revitalization, storytelling, cultural reclamation. And this is a huge success story. They've created enclaves of language learning, revitalization of song, dances, storytelling, ceremony, temporary land reoccupation with site-specific work and a network of indigenous theaters and theater programs across Canada. This is a tremendous success story. There's an opportunity in cities to develop stronger networks with our relatives outside of the city in terms of the development of alternative economic systems, access to local food networks, access to local activist networks, access to the media. There are elders and knowledge holders in the city that have had to move here in order to be closer to family, that are hospitalized or in nursing homes. And to me, this is a tremendous gift in urban indigenous communities. One of the immediate things we can do in urban and rural environments, and that many community-based groups are already undertaking, is the very hard but important work of dismantling heteropatriarchy and the systems of gendered violence in our community spaces and creating safer spaces for indigenous women and queer people where we are celebrated and cherished. To me, this is the center, this is the core of our nation building work because gendered violence steals something very, very precious from us that's very, very difficult to get back and that's our intimacy and our ability to connect in a good way to the people that we love. We know from our experience that the fastest way to remove people from the land, the fastest way to dispossess, is to attack women and children with sexual and gendered violence because it destroys families almost instantly. Families are the core of our governance in our political system and all of our social organization. They are the direct contact to the land. Breaking that, was the point of residential schools. The violence that was introduced into our nations in residential schools is still very much a part of how settler colonialism is maintained and reproduced in Canada. Here we have Canada talking about reconciliation out of one side of its mouth, while the other side is silent to over 600 missing and murdered indigenous women, taking no responsibility 
Worse than that, actively perpetuating the conditions that propel violence against indigenous women. The assumption that I met with a lot is that because I've, because I've achieved success in Western education, because I have the privilege and honor of speaking to you 2,000 kilometers away from my homeland in this fancy room, that I've somehow escaped that violence, that somehow I'm not personally impacted by that violence. And that's not true, because I don't think that that's true for any indigenous women. I remember first being called a slut when I was eight years old. I remember first being called a squaw when I was 16, and both those labels continually have been applied to me throughout my life for no other reason than being an Anishinaabe Kwe. And they're not just labels, they have been accompanied by very real physical, sexual, and emotional violence, as well as an ongoing systemic violence that is both racialized and gender. Violence that is designed to steal the most intimate parts of me from me. I'm not here because I escaped that. I'm here tonight because I was lucky enough to have some of the tools to shield myself from that. And because I was just lucky, I was just lucky to survive. I don't want an inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women because I don't see any indication that an inquiry is anything more than just another false gift of reconciliation. Indigenous women in our two-spirit and queer community already know why this is happening, and we already know what has to be done to make it stop. I want an immediate transformation where the position of indigenous women in Canadian society is radically altered from worthless commodities to cherished, honored people. And I need it to be radical and immediate because my daughter is eight and she has no idea what she's been born into because no child should ever have to come into what our young indigenous kids have to. At the end of the day, the Canadian reconciliation process is being driven by the Canadian state. And the Canadian state has a vested interest in upholding the system of settler colonialism because they want the natural resources from our lands. I think it's a deliberate strategic move on their part to keep land out of the conversation. And we know this, I know this, because of their actions on the ground. So what does reconciliation look like from within indigenous traditions? What do Anishinaabe political traditions have to say about how we reconcile? Well, Anishinaabe political and legal traditions have a very long history of restorative justice. And on an individual level, this means that rather than having a criminal justice system based on authoritarian power and punishment, we've practiced a system of accountability, responsibility, and restoration. So to give an example, if I steal your bike and I get caught, the community then comes together to support both the victim and the perpetrator. There is a series of ceremonies of conversations and healing measures that takes place that usually end up in a circle where everyone who has been impacted by the event has a chance to speak to it and to share their feelings around it. And through this collective process, the community as both individuals and as a community come to understand how the events happened, the context. Then it becomes the responsibility of the perpetrator and their family to engage in a series of actions to regenerate trust, to restore balance, to return property, to repair damages to individuals and families and communities. And context matters in this system. If the theft of the bike was a result of poverty and hardship, then the community has a responsibility to address those underlying conditions. And like most systems in Anishinaabe political theory, this basic process that you can use within your own family right now grows into a community process and also a national and international process. So what would reconciliation look like from within this system? Well, it would be Anishinaabe people, the people who are the targets of the genocidal practices, who would be driving the process, not the Canadian state. 
Anishinaabe people would decide the steps that Canada needs to take to regenerate trust and to restore balance. Anishinaabe people would decide how Canada assists in the regeneration of our language, education, cultures, indigenous knowledge, political systems, governance, restitution. Canadians take on the responsibility of reconciliation in their actions and make changes to their society and political system to ensure that what's happened doesn't ever happen again. And central to this process, in my mind, is the reorganization of land so that indigenous peoples have the ability to maintain and continue their cultures and life ways. Indigenous peoples must have homelands. We are currently engaged in a process of reconciliation where the end point of settler colonialism is still the same, the dispossession of indigenous peoples from our lands to facilitate the hyperdevelopment of extractivist industries. We have not changed the relationship if this is still the end point, if that's still the goal. And while it has fallen out of fashion to do things like conduct medical experiments on indigenous children, to take them away from their family for years on end and subject them to physical, emotional, and sexual abuse with the purpose of assimilating them, it is still acceptable in Canadian society to take our land, to take our natural resources, and to develop them without permission and without our consent. And so I resent the facade that Canadian reconciliation creates. It gives the impression to people who aren't paying attention that things are changing and that things are getting better when I think things are getting much, much worse. Our lands, the lands that we have left, have never been under more pressure than right now. Environmental degradation, increased resource development pressure, increased settlement pressure for territories close to urban areas, changes in the Indian Act, a land claim process that is designed at its core to diminish nationhood, to terminate Aboriginal and treaty rights, and to lock First Nations into an asymmetric relationship with the state forever. But this is an inevitable. We have a choice. We collectively have a choice. Colonialism is just a train wreck of bad choices. Each indigenous nation has its own culturally based, distinct process for dealing with wrongdoing, both on an international level and an individual level. And for reconciliation to be transformative, these are the systems that must drive the reconciliation process in Canada. Because when you're engaged in the right kind of process, you generate good questions. And when you generate good questions, you generate good answers, and you generate good relationships. And I think that that's the key to making reconciliation a transformative process, one that dismantles the violence of settler colonialism, and one that uh, restores the relationship between indigenous nations and settlers to be one of, of peace and justice and honor. Miigwech. Um, so Am said that uh, because of the, uh, the turnover for the next event that we should start considering kind of taking off um, out of here um, within the next 20 minutes. So um, until then we can, um, we can uh, engage Leanne's ideas um, in a bit of a question period. So I'll moderate and then we have a couple of um, uh, mics here which we can uh, provide to you so your voice is heard. I'd um, just like to say very beautiful, eloquent, engaging, and needed speech. Um, I commend you on it. 
Um, my, my family has a long history of Native rights um, uh, activism from my, great, from my grandfather, my father, my sister, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my, my uncle was the first Native judge, was in BC, et cetera. Um, my sister was at Oka. My grandfather was a part of the BC Union of Indian Chiefs, and, um, and the president is then near Brotherhood of British Columbia, was in BC. Um, I'm honored by your speech. I'm, I'm, I think you're, you're, you've, you've hit it on the head. You know, it's, it's about land rights. It's about um, reconciliation of people, nation to nation, um, both within individually and as, in, as, as, as groups of people from was around, was around around both Canada and the world. And I, I really like to, to see a transcript of your speech because that was amazing. Thank you. I'll make wish for those kind words. Thank you. Okay. My name is Rodney Little Mustache, or Mestu Awastan, from the Pikani Nation in southern Alberta. Um, I've been watching the news, like, for the last... People tell me not to watch the news, right, because it's stressing me out sometimes. <laughs> and with what's going on with Harper, and when I saw him speak at that, what do you call, at their policy convention in Calgary, and what he said, it was it's our way or no way. And when he talked about us using our determination to meet um, in the end, like to make a better country, right? But when he was talking about us, he wasn't talking about all of us. He was talking about the people in that room. When I was growing up, right, I, my view of politics was old white people. And I don't mean that disrespect, right? That, that's what I saw. And that's what I saw in that room, and yesterday when I watched my mother graduate from the University of Calgary, I saw that on stage, all conservative, right? It all came back, right? And seeing all this and how Harper is so, uh, and other governments are so um, against us having our ways, right? When you talk about homeland, do you mean independent nations? Because that would be something like, it will, I don't know, scare the hell out of Harper, I think. <laughs> I think I'm okay scaring the hell out of Harper. <laughs> when I say homelands, I mean how homelands are, are uh, conceptualized within different indigenous philosophies and how, what they mean to us on our own terms. And so that's, that may be different for different indigenous nations. Um, I think that we have, our nations have never, um, I think the Anishinaabek Nation ha has had an interdependency with other indigenous nations prior to colonialism. We had links, we had relationships. And so um, this idea of independent states um, doesn't, I, I have difficulty um, thinking about that inside the language and inside the political concepts that, I, that are culturally inherent. So I think it, it means something different to me. But I think that should also be scary to Harper. <laughs> Hi there. My name is uh, Johnny Manson, and um, I'm Tlokwit First Nation, uh, Nuchanuth. Uh, and I, I'm really. Um, Grateful that you gave the talk tonight. I appreciate it a lot. Um, I've gone through the education system. Uh, it, it took me a very long time to get through the education system. And I, well-meaning allies, uh, uh, but I, I th when I'm trying to communicate with them a lot of the times, it seems like we're kind of talking past each other around certain issues, and I think that It'd be very helpful if we could find a way to even communicate with our allies around things like, for instance, uh, when we want to research our elders, <laughs> research our elders, mm -hmm. that's, and the, the, this kind of process that we put them through, you know, I, I don't think they understand that a lot of the time. And I don't think that our allies understand 
how important, I hope this helps a lot, but like how important the land is to us. And I keep seeing it. People keep going to these talks and they're saying, oh yeah, I understand. And then when we get back into the academic world, they're, they're practicing things that make it seem like they don't understand. And I don't, like, do you see a way around this? Because I've seen it over and over. Well, I think I, I have a couple of really amazing allies in my life. And I think what makes them amazing is that they have an ability to listen very, very deeply. And they have the ability to sit through um, some very uncomfortable conversations and they have the ability to, to act and to make different decisions. So I think, um, I think what's frustrating sometimes about allies is exactly what you're saying. You feel like um, you're, you're speaking and not being heard, and, or, or you feel like maybe you even are being heard, and then when you get to the, you get to the university or you get to whatever you're doing, um, the status quo gets maintained. So I think these relationships are, are very labor intensive and they're emotionally intensive, but I think there's a group of, of people in Canada that um, are very interested in figuring out how to have a respectful relationship with indigenous nations. And I think that that group of people is a tremendously important part of transformation. And transformation is never easy, and our struggles are not easy, and it's not going to be easy. Um, and so I think creating networks of indigenous people and allies that you feel very comfortable with and that you trust and that are around you, I think that's, that's a really critical, that's been a really critical, um, important thing for me to do in my life. And then when you have that, when you have that nest, of people that kind of love you unconditionally, then I think you can go out and do this work um, with allies or, or land protection work, and you can um, maintain a, a, a sense of yourself and a, and a core that's, that's healthy. So I think um, none of this is going to happen. None of the transformation I'm talking about is going to be easy, and it's not going to, it's, it's not going to happen without a tremendous amount of struggle and sacrifice. Chris, <coughs> sorry, I have a bit of a cold here. Crystal Smith, the way you get the Tahoe Vancouver, that would zagu, because Pagwada de Pituco. My name is Crystal Smith, um, and I'm from the Gitkat Nation, Hartley Bay. Um, I'm currently studying to be a teacher. <laughs> and so, um, one particular thing that you said that directly affects me, um, other than being Aboriginal, being an Aboriginal woman, but being a teacher and having to work with the curriculum. Um, and what you said was that curriculum um, kind of like destroys the learning of children. Yeah. Um, so as a teacher, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's a good question. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, I really feel like um, what you're kind of talking about is schooling um, in terms of rather than educating. So education is like lifelong from when you're born to when you pass. Yes. Um, and schooling is when you have to go to school and hmm. kindergarten to 12 to university. Um, but as I'm in this kind of between where I'm not quite a teacher yet and learning how to be a teacher and whatnot, um, I'm seeing a change of curriculum. Mm. Um, I mean, you look at none of it, um, and they have an amazing curriculum there where they're teaching about um, Aboriginal res residential school in, in elementary and in high school. Um, it's not where I want it to be yet, and BC is kind of lagging behind in my perspective. But things are changing. And um, I'm just wondering, like, your kind of perspective on that, if you could elaborate more. Well, well, thank you for, um, for bringing that up, because that's an important, an important um, 
consideration because I also teach in institutions with curriculum. Um, I think that the point that you made that there's a difference between education and schooling is, is very, very important. And I think one of the things that indigenous parents are constantly doing is they're providing uh, education in addition to schooling and undoing some of the things that kids are learning in the school. Um, I think that um, this idea of, of child-led um, traditional kinds of education that are outside of the institution and that are on the land where the, I guess the land is sort of the curriculum and the, the relationships are sort of the curriculum and there's this sense of joy and freedom and kids don't even know they're learning, right? Um, I think that bringing in more of that is important. And I think that um, there are uh, thousands and millions of beautiful ways that you're going to be able to intervene and create space and create an environment that I would have dreamt <laughs> it would have been an amazing experience for me to have as an indigenous child. So I don't want you to take my sort of um, half-assed comments about <laughs> curriculum <laughs> and sort of uh, uh, take them to heart because I think there's, there's many, many ways of having an impact. And I think that uh, just from your question, it seems like you, uh, you understand what I'm talking about. And thank you for speaking your language. We have time for a couple more questions, preferably not from men. Hi, uh, <laughs> my name is no. Jan Constantinescu, and I'm a ally in process. I'm here. Um, and I guess my comment is that tonight, what you said very importantly, I think, is the end game of, of the settler society, and that that is resource extraction. Um, and for me, to even have that question is really, really radical. I think that that's very important to know that question, um, that, that we're not on the same page when we're using that as an end line. And I'm wondering if uh, the environmental movement is of any support in the, is an ally or not? Um, well, I think, going back to your question, I think um, I've, I've sort of worked on and off with the environmental movement for 20 years, and I think on some things, uh, um, they're allies. I think in terms of, of extractivist um, development, they're allies. I think um, they have a long way to go in understanding indigenous nationhood and resurgence and, um, and our political ideas. Um, but I think there's an, there is an impetus with that group of allies because they're recognizing that this capitalistic hyper-development of natural resources is causing some extreme damage to the environment and that we have you know, a decade left to prevent global climate disaster. And so there's a, a very um, real consequence of, of this machine that's sort of bulldozing over our mother. And so I think it's an opportunity. And I think it's an opportunity to have more of these kinds of discussions. Yeah. Um, OK, my name is Caleb Bain. I'm Etcher Denny and Danizan. I acknowledge my presence in unceded occupied Coast Salish territory. Leah, my question is two part. One, um, you mentioned returning to the mother um, when she's sick. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on um, the mother when she's so sick that she abuses us. And I'm thinking of endocrine disruptors, persistent organic pollutants, friends of mine like in the Athabasca chip nation who face um, significant, like, I mean, genetic consequences of returning to their lands. Um, naturally occurring radioactive materials in my territory in northeastern British Columbia. You know, the, the responsibility to, resp to return is significant, but also I wonder about the responsibility to, um, to engage with your responsibilities when that, that development comes. And I guess my related point is, what's your perspective on the rights-based discourse, both in law and in society, relative to the responsibility-based discourse and the risks and rewards associated with using either? Because when it comes to things like POPs, things that actually like bend and make the mother abusive to us, we engage with some very difficult questions, and I've been having a hard time wrestling with that thing about going back to my territory, the tar sands, or wherever. Must be true. I think that um, I... I am the mother, that I am the land, and that when the land is contaminated, 
I'm also contaminated, right? And that first environment that, um, that I carry new life in, that water, is a direct link to the contamination. So I think in my territory, in southern Ontario, we have a similar problem. You have to find a way of connecting to the land when you maybe can't drink the water and you maybe can't swim in the water. And so I've always been a little bit fierce in that regard. And so if I can't eat the fish and I can't swim and I can't drink it, I can still canoe across it. And um, so that's sort of how I, I see that. Um, I think, uh, ultimately, I think the rights-based discourse um, in the long term doesn't put us in the right direction. I think resurgence in nation building is, is, is for me, the, the thing that makes the most sense. I think that some of the rights-based discourse in the short term um, has some benefits, but I think um, for me and my work in, in terms of my own abilities and gifts, I think this, this nation building and resurgence is something that uh, I want to put my energy into. Yeah. So thank you. I think. <laughs> I suppose. Hello, my name is uh, Beatrice Starr I'm from Bella Bella. I've lived, lived down here for the past 40 years, and I'm part of part of women from the downtown east side. Women's Center and okay, uh, I'm announcing about the Feb 14th March, and we're part of that. Our first meeting is on Friday at 10 o'clock at the Women's Center. And I like Power to Women because it's given me a voice to speak. Because you know, I was fortunate not to go to residential school because I had a grandmother that had a. Everyone was scared of her, and she protected all her. <laughs> Her kids and her grandchildren. Only one, one of her daughters went, and I've seen the impact at what she went through. And and I'm 31 years sober, and my story is out on the internet about abuse and child apprehension. And as my kids went permanent end of 81, and I didn't know that I could appeal. And I appealed. It took me four years to fight in, and I won my case in 86, so I got my kids back. So if you want to read our stories, there's 12 of us on uh, Power to Women or Vancouver Media Co-op on the Internet. There's 12 of us on there. So I don't like my picture taken, so mine's a yellow, yellow flower with a bumblebee on top of it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Masi Cho, thank you. Um, um, Leanne will be here for a little bit. Uh, we'll be outside uh, where her books are. And uh, I just want to say thank you all for coming and to again end with a very warm welcome for uh, Dr. Simpson. Merci.